Hello there. Today we're going to look at this paper, Tree Ring Watermarks, Fingerprints for Diffusion Images that are Invisible and Robust. This is by Yuxin Wen, John Kirkenbauer, Jonas Geiping, and Tom Goldstein of the University of Maryland. In very brief overview, this paper proposes a watermark technique for images of generative models, specifically of diffusion models. And while other watermark techniques usually take the image that comes out of a diffusion model and do some sort of modification to it as a post-processing step. Uh, this paper, it enters right from the beginning. So it goes at the source into the latent space, into the noise space of the diffusion model, watermarks it there, lets the diffusion process run forward. And thus that signal is not distinguishable either by the human and also much more robust to post-processing attacks or perturbation attacks. We're going to go look at a bit of a review of diffusion models themselves because it's important to understand what happens here and then we'll go into how this technique works. It's a pretty basic technique in itself uh, but it is quite effective and I find it quite, um, quite ingenious of how this is done. So let's start from the top. The authors here, they state these diffusion models, they obviously can generate images and they get very much better day by day. And there has arisen the need for tracing whether or not an image is generated by a given model. So there is tracing, in this case, they say there's copyright preventing potential harm from AI generated content, or simply you want to know whether or not a given image was produced by one of these models. Now, the setup we're going to have right here is the following is that the model is going to be behind an API. So this is the model. And there is some sort of an API that people can use in order to generate pictures. So people will make a call here, and they will get an image out of that. This the technique works like this. So the weights of the model need to be hidden and need to be only available to the uh, person who does the watermarking. Otherwise, naturally, anyone can just use the model and produce images without the watermarks and, and thus watermarking would be kind of useless. I mean, even if the model is available, at least you can then watermark things that uh, the that are behind this API. In any case, our notion considers that it's behind an API, people call the model via some sort of API or web interface, and get an image out. Now this image right here, if we have watermarked it correctly, so if the watermarking process at the location of the model happened correctly, then for this image, we can always prove that it in fact was created by this model. So we'll implant some kind of signal, some kind of hidden signal in that image that the end user neither notices, so it's invisible or indiscernible, nor do they have an easy power of making it go away. So let's say even if you tell someone, hey, by the way, I've watermarked this image, uh, it, it's not, they don't necessarily, they can't necessarily make it go away easily. And the main advantage of the uh, method we're going to look at today is that second part. So even if I tell you that I have watermarked this image, it is very difficult. And you'll see a borderline impossible with without strong perturbations to make it go away, even under strong perturbations, it's usually recoverable. So what does this watermarking technique do? It's quite simple, it goes into the, the into the latent space, as I said, of a diffusion process. So in very basic terms, we're going to first look at what diffusion models do, because we needed to understand what this watermarking technique does. In a diffusion model, what you'll do is you'll train a model to step by step produce an image from random noise. So you'll start with a image, let's just consider it of the same size of random noise. So this is just random Gaussian noise, every pixel you sample from a Gaussian, and then you go through it step by step. So in every step, you remove a little bit of noise every step, every step until after many steps, 
slowly an image forms, like here, in this case, the, the teddy bear we just saw. This might seem a bit like magic if you've never seen diffusion models work or don't know why they work. But yes, we have a model that takes in an image that is initially just pure random noise. And then by repeated application of that model, we transform that noise into a image. Why does this work? Because of the way we train it. The way we train this is we actually take images from the data set. So let's say we take an image from a house, and we corrupt it by a little bit of noise. So we add, we add a little bit of noise in this case, epsilon noise. And that gives us the same image with just a little bit of noise. And then what we do is we train a model to take in this image and give back the image before the noise. But that's doable. That's doable with deep learning. We can take a little bit of a corrupted noisy image and we can ask, you know, what's the uncorrupted version of that image? Okay, so we have a one step noise remover. We can also do it two steps, right? We can then take that image and add a little bit of noise again. And that will give us, I should make equal signs here, that will give us the same image with even a little bit more noise, right? More noise. And then we train a neural network to recover that original image that was only noised once. So we can create our own training data for this process by simply starting with real data, adding noise, adding noise, adding noise, adding noise. And then it is a property of uh, statistics and of specifically also the Gaussian distribution that if we repeatedly apply noise, we have to do some scaling, but if we repeatedly ap apply noise over and over again, infinitely many times, but you know, in practice, finitely many, but just many times, what we'll end up with in the limit is just gonna be random Gaussian noise. Okay. So that is the last piece we need in order to make diffusion work. The mathematical fact that if I add noise and noise and noise and noise and noise and noise and noise over and over again, to a real data point, no matter what it is, in the limit, it's going to be pure, random Gaussian noise following exactly the Gaussian distribution, which means that the reverse process we train right here is exactly so that end point here is exactly something we can actually produce from a sampler. So exactly the starting point here. And because we train a neural network here to reverse each step individually, right, we, we create our own training data for that, we can then use that to produce each step here individually. So we can simply say, hey, here's the last step of here is the pure random noise. What's the one step before that in the noise process, it will tell us. And what's the one step before that? it will tell us too. we just apply that learned neural network, that network that we trained to just reverse one step in this noising process over and over until we arrive at an image. So this here acts as a bit of like the random seed um, to to as an input. And then the image that's produced is going to be a deterministic function of just applying the reverse network that we trained over and over again, starting from that random seed. And it's exactly in this random seed over here that we're going to embed some sort of key. Um, and you can already see what that does by changing the random seed will in fact change the image that's being produced. And in in quite in quite cool ways. So the effect of this watermark is going to be entirely different from the effects of other watermarking technique that just work on the end result. And you can already, you know, think ahead a bit of what that's going to be. So formally, this is the process, um, we define a noising process. So we define the forward process, by which we mean, how do we produce a more noisy version from a less noisy version. So x t minus one here is going to be the less noisy version x zero being the original image, and x t is going to be the more noisy version, well, it's pretty simple, we simply take xt minus one, and I'm pretty sure this here is a typo, this should actually be xt minus one, we simply take xt minus one, and we use it as the center of a um, Gaussian with a diagonal covariance, uh, which is going to be defined by beta here, beta is a schedule parameter, um, it's a scheduled variance at step t. And because of the properties of this process, we have to scale 
um, the mean right here. But that's is just so we can keep the scale because if you add noise, then eventually your your variance your variance gets bigger and bigger. So we need to apply a scaling factor. But it, this here is essentially the same as saying I take xt minus one and I add epsilon, epsilon being a multivariate normal distribution centered around zero. And, um, and yeah, with the with the variance beta t, and then I scale that, or I scale it, I scale it first, and then I add epsilon. So scaling factor times the point, I just contract it a little bit, it's centered around zero usually, and then I apply the noise. So that's the noising process, taking it, adding noise. What that means is because everything's Gaussians and Gaussians compose really nicely, is that I can also jump to any point of the process. So I can take the original image and I can say, what's the 50th step in that process? And I can just calculate that by calculating the scaling factor and the variance factor that I need to apply in one step. So there are just formulas where I can just jump ahead. So in that way, as I said, I can create my own training data, every step in this process from image to fully noise, I can produce unsupervised, just from a set of original images. And then I can learn that one step reverse network. So let's say we have that um, the property here. So that the reverse process is here. So we have a learned noise predictor um, that estimates the noise that's being added to a single image to reach step t. You can either go back one step, as I described above, or what is also possible is you can learn to go back t steps at a time, right? you can learn to go back 50 steps in one. And what many current inference methods do is they start at a fully noised image, and let's say, and they estimate what's the original image, they do it in one step, they just jump 100 steps ahead. And then maybe they get a really crappy image, because obviously, you know, this is just pure noise. <laughs> but then they, they jump 49 steps ahead. And then from that, they infer again, the, the t the x zero. And then from that, they jump 48 steps ahead, and so on. So it turns out that this way, uh, things tend to be a bit more robust, even even though it's kind of less intuitive to do it this way. But also what it allows you to do is it allows you to actually jump steps. So you can say I only want to infer every fifth step in this process, and it can still kind of work. Whereas if you were to do it step by step by step by step, you kind of have no choice but to go down the, the 100 steps, you know, step by step. It's a technicality that doesn't change anything about the math, but it is just an optimization you can do in practice. What they say is, um, if if we have this learned model, sorry, if we have this learned model, epsilon, this run right here, again, this is the trained model that removes one step of noise or x steps of noise. If we have that, if we trained that because we created our own training data, they say it is also possible to move in the opposite direction. Uh, we can describe a process that retrieves an initial noise vector, which maps to an image close to the original image. So maybe you've heard of GAN inversions before and so on to recover the latent vector given an image, this is exactly the same. So rather, then starting at some image, and well, that's a crappy teddy bear, <laughs> starting at some image, and then just adding noise until we have some kind of noise, we can say, hey, what noise do I need to what noise should be here, so that using this reverse process using my trained reverse process, I can get back to that image. So we took training data, we noised it, that's how we create created our training data, then we learned a reverse model that goes back to the image space. And now once we've done that, we can ask, given that I have an image that I know was produced by such a model, can I recover the exact noise that was used to produce it. 
So this third layer, this is like layer one creating the training data, layer two is actually training the reverse model and using it. And layer three is can I now recover the original noise given an image. And that you just need to recognize that that's actually possible with this diffusion model. Um, it is it is a, a process that has an assumption, the assumption is this right here, that's a technical assumption, it simply says, these steps are small enough, that the t -th step is essentially the same has the same properties as the t plus one step. So the neural network that learns to go from step 99 to 98. So to remove that 98th step of noise in that process is essentially the same as the neural network that remove that learns to remove from 98 to 97. And that's a reasonable assumption given that you have enough steps in your diffusion process. Normally, you just learn one neural network anyway, which you give like a time parameter rather than n different neural networks. Therefore, it's a reasonable assumption to do. And given that you can in fact, follow the process back and uh, recover the original image, they uh, say that's an inversion process rather than a reverse process, which is already a used word. Uh, so you start at a real image, and you get the noise that was used or would be used to produce that image using your diffusion model. Note that in this process, you actually need that diffusion model. They say, interestingly, they find that the inversion also succeeds well enough for conditional diffusion models, even when the conditioning is not provided. So if you have something like stable diffusion, where you need to input a piece of text, um, you can you don't even need the text that was used, you can just take the image and reverse it and you will still find that noise. So the process is going to be as follows. Um, as we said before, the model is somewhere here, user calls through the API, the model is going to sample an initial noise vector, then the model is going to mark the noise vector with some sort of of key, they call it. So they are going to watermark the noise vector in this case, the noise image. So I'll put some, some uh, key in there. And then they'll use the model to produce an image given that perturbed uh, noise vector, and then they'll return that. Once the user has it, um, they may then use it, let's say they use it for something bad. And you want to determine later, did this in fact come from the model, you would go back here, you would go to the model, you would use the reverse process to find the noise that it was created with. And if you find that watermark in the noise, then you know, it has been created by this particular um, model, because no one else, that's our assumption, knows the weights of this model, therefore, no one else has the ability to reverse the process. And therefore, if you find that watermark, it is a strong indication that this model was in fact used to create that image. So how do we watermark? That's up here. We watermark like this, as I said, um, we produce the initial noise, in this case, a picture of, of uh, independent Gaussian samples, then we do what they call watermarking in Fourier space. So we run a fast Fourier transform to Fourier space. Now Gaussians in Fourier space are just Gaussians. Um, that's a, it's a property of a Gaussian distribution. So I actually don't even know why they exactly do a Fourier space in the first place. But let's Let's assume there's some scaling properties or something like this. Um, then they add what they call a predefined key and their predefined key are these types of ring keys, they have various different methods of doing that. So various different variants of that. But in the easiest case, they just sort of set a ring or a number of rings here to a given value, or for example, zero or three or five. And then the pattern um, of if you go from the inside from the center towards the outside. So the pattern like one, zero, zero, minus two, zero, three, one, like that, sorry, that pattern here, that would be your key. So your key would be the 
these values right here, like 1, 0, 0, minus 2, 0, 3, 1. Um, and you imprint that onto the latent space as these rings in Fourier space. The reason why it's rings is because in Fourier space, if you have a ring marking, then you are um, you're invariant to certain perturbations. And they find that down here. Let me find that. So these are some some properties. Note, you could even do that without the Fourier space and without rings and so on, and it would still work in principle. However, we're going to use some some nice facts and features of Fourier transformations and of, of rings in Fourier space. So they say a rotation in pixel space co corresponds to a rotation in Fourier space. So if you rotate the picture, then you also rotate its, its Fourier um, transformed result or, or its representation in Fourier space. And therefore, because we have the ring, um, if we transform the image or the original noise in that case, after the reverse process, the key is still going to look the same because rotation doesn't change anything at a, at a circle. Um, I, yeah. A translation in pixel space multiplies all Fourier coefficients by a constant complex number. So again, a translation in pixel space um, is a multiplication Fourier space, which is again, I think a rotation. Oh, no, all Fourier coefficients. Okay, so maybe it's a scaling as well. That I'm honestly not sure anymore. So multiplication in Fourier in complex space is certainly a rotation of the complex number. Um, however, what they could mean here is that it's just like a scaling. And in that case, our ring patterns would just get bigger or smaller or, or wider or narrower, but we could still detect the basic patterns. Uh, so there is an, an invariance or an equivariance there. A dilation, dilation or compression in pixel space corresponds to a compression or a dilation in Fourier space. Note the Inversion dilation here corresponds to compression here, compression here corresponds to dilation here, and the color jitter um, adding a constant to all pixels corresponds to changing the magnitude of the zero frequency Fourier mode. So if I change the entire pixel, if I add like some, some constant color, or I make it just brighter, I would simply change one single pixel in Fourier space, which is, I mean, a cool property because the zero pixel here it just kind of defines uh, the the baseline constant of the whole thing so if you um i'm sure you are aware otherwise uh, look into fourier transforms they're really really cool so we go to fourier space with the original noise we add our key in that ring fashion in fourier space we then do an inverse fourier transform and thus we arrive at what they call watermarked XT. Now you can't buy per se say anything this here is still looks kind of noisy. It's obviously no longer pure Gaussian noise. It's no longer of the original intended distribution. However, um, it's still close enough, close enough for the model uh, to produce good results. Obviously, we haven't trained the model the diffusion model on that modified distribution. But it is maybe thinkable to train something that would take that in. Um, that's that's maybe another thought for another time. But can we train a diffusion model that has these watermarked, uh, these watermarked noises as an actual training distribution? I don't know. However, from that, we're just going to run the normal diffusion model, and we'll get an image. And that image is just, just the output of the diffusion model. The only thing we changed is the input. Okay? We don't need to post process anything about this image, it is already watermarked. Because let's say someone uses it, if someone uses that image somewhere and we want to figure out, has this image been produced by our model, even if it's perturbed, but it doesn't need to be perturbed, right? What we can do is we can do that inverse process, we require the model weights for that, as we said before, so only we can do it, 
we take the image, we make the inverse process, and we read out the key. So if that image has been produced by our model, uh, then that key will show up in if we do the inversion, plus obviously the Fourier space, it will show up in Fourier space. And then we can see whether it's close enough to the key that we implanted, or close enough to which key we implanted. And there we can say not only is it from our from our API, but maybe even which user or which key has been used to watermark uh, that image. The, the, um, the interesting bit twofold, first of all, as they said, you don't necessarily need a text information if the diffusion model had a conditioning text input. And second of all, that even under strong perturbation, as they say here, that Fourier signal tends to be retained. Now, you'll see an interesting property right here, namely, yes, compared to other watermarking techniques, we do in fact change the input of the um, diffusion process, and we change it by quite a bit, right? So that means this image here is totally different than this, this, the image that would have been produced by this image, uh, this input right here. But it doesn't matter, because it's still according, right, to to the diffusion process, and the noise is still close enough to the training distribution that it actually works. So here you have a comparison of different watermarking te techniques, and you immediately see what's different. This is the produced image without watermark, right? Now from the same noise, um, from the same noise, we can watermark it with different techniques. So these and this here are two different techniques um, of watermarking that post process the image. So that adds something in the Fourier space, but of the image, right? So you have some modifications here or some modifications with, with somewhere in the image. However, this one here is is totally different, but it's still according to the prompt, which is like some teddy bear in front of a White House. Do they have the prompt? They, they specify it somewhere. But the cool thing is, uh, you can see if you zoom in, you can see the watermark here, you know, with these with these black dots, right? Or you can see the watermark here, uh, show up in the image. However, none visible here, because there is no watermark in the final image, it's it's a totally different image. And the original noise specified the watermark, which also means that if I this here, if I just run some blur or something across that or some post processing, I can easily corrupt that watermark easily remove that watermark. Uh, however, here, no matter how much I, I blur it, and so on, it's still overall the same image. And that image is the watermarked version. So the way you can think of this is that the watermarked, the watermarking method essentially defines a new modified model that has a different output distribution than the original model. And that output distribution itself defines the watermark. So no two, which is also interesting, no two watermarking methods will kind of result in that same output distribution. So even after watermarking, there's probably applications to this where you can kind of steer the output distribution, we just don't exactly know how yet. But it could be an additional control and in addition to whatever latent conditioning or whatnot is to define modification or filters onto the original noise to achieve a particular output distribution. All right. Uh, they highlight a few things here. Um, in patterns imprinted into Fourier space, the, of the noise vector of the diffusion model is far more robust than existing methods, no additional training or fine tuning required to implement. I have looked at the results right here. And I don't think the results are necessarily worth um, too much going into. By the way, as I said, they have different ways of Im imprinting. Uh, three ring zeros gives a circular region of an array of zeros, then there is sort of random um, three ring rand, which has different properties, but is not invariant to some image manipulations. That's probably a typo right here as well, maybe many should, should say many instead of make. And then there is three ring rings, which I've shown you, which is the multiple concentric um, rings and having a constant value along each ring.
but all of them, they have slightly different properties, but may result or result in the same principle. The experiments look such that you can see the both in the uh, clean and adversarial case. In the clean case, most of these methods tend to recover that watermark or detect that watermark, um, which you would obviously even especially from the ones that modify the output image directly you would expect. But then in the adversarial case where someone really tries to remove that watermark after uh, post processing, but without knowing the model explicitly, um, you can see that there is a, a big difference, for example, here, um, uh, area under curve over in the 90s, and for the other methods much lower and the same at um, true true positives at one, I think, uh, is that f one, two positives, one percentage of false positive rate. I'm not sure. I haven't read here. Okay, sorry. No, it's the true positive rate when the false positive rate is 1%. Of course, uh, too dumb for me. So the true positive rate at the point where the false positive rate is 1%. So these detectors, you always have to calibrate. So you calibrate them at the point where the false positive rate is 1%. Look at the true positive rate. It's in the 70s over here. And it's way below way below. So the question is, what do we give up for it? Like, obviously, we modify the original distribution, uh, that gives us good watermarks. But modifying the original distribution necessarily means our model wasn't trained for it. And therefore, there is a trade off. And you can see this right here in FID score. Um, so in this case, lower is better. And um, you'll see that in terms of FID scores, it does it is comparable to these other other watermarking techniques. And therefore, one can at least say, well, it's not super duper bad. Um, in fact, it's probably not noticeable. And that's what you want out of a, a watermarking, um, watermarking method, they have different experiments on robustness, I will leave those away from now, uh, just be aware that it does in fact, it is in fact, quite robust to any sort of um, to any sort of perturbation and they do ablation studies, and more. So the experimental section is quite extensive. But as I said, I don't want to go too much into this right here. If you're interested, uh, please check out the paper for yourself. They finally discuss the limitations, they say the proposed watermark is by design only verifiable by the model owner, because the model parameters are needed to perform the inversion process. So it is not like a, let's say a public key uh, cryptography signature, where anyone can verify that like I wrote the message, but only I can verify that a given image was produced from my model. Um, maybe there is in the future, a way that expands on this method that actually achieves this. They also say currently, it is not yet clear how large the capacity for multiple keys would be uh, keys. Yeah. And in that case, the question is, okay, the key I've shown you before with the concentric rings, right, how many of those could I use and still being able to differentiate between all of them. Um, that is mainly a property of how much the per how much the perturbations affect. Um, so the perturbations that an attacker would use the ones we saw right here. So let me say, let me think I attack now I put a strong perturbation because I want to remove that watermark, that's necessarily going to corrupt my ability to reverse that process and going to corrupt the image I get out here, plus the inversion process itself has some inaccuracies. So I'll get like an inaccurate um, reverse thing. And then I have a threshold of how close I want the two to be together. So a mixture of how strong the perturbations should be be or should it be robust to and that threshold um, that I set right here will determine how many keys I can solidly distinguish from one another. Uh, but it's I mean, it's a property of experimentation, they just say they don't know yet. And neither do I. All right, that was about all I had to say of this paper, I find it a really, really cool method. Um, it is noticeably different. It's like a little bit, I mean, obviously, it's kind of obvious if you think from 
you know, hindsight, but it is also thinking a little bit outside the box. And I think it's also a nice, a nice application or a nice uh, demonstration of you can work with modern state of the art, this could have been done by a high school student or so in a collab, right. And you can absolutely work with um, state of the art uh, models and still do really meaningful research and write really good papers without necessarily uh, many resources at your disposal, you just have to be a bit creative what exactly you investigate. Uh, the topic of whether or not watermarking is a good thing and where it's applicable in the first place, I don't want to touch here. That was it for me. Um, leave comments, like and bye bye.